So my name is Zia Bian. Uh, I'm uh, part of the program on science and global security, which is uh, in the Woodrow Wilson School of Public and International Affairs. And the topic of the discussion is restoring American power, war, peace, international order, and Donald Trump. Um, but by way of uh, explanation, you should know that I am not a political scientist. Um, but I do have a passing interest in these issues, as I'm sure some of you do too. So um, what I want to do is to begin by making uh, uh, some brief remarks to lay out how um, I'm trying to think about uh, these issues of what Trump means when he talks about making America great again. And specifically, not in terms of white male patriarchal authority and so on, that it's a separate set of discussions, um, but in terms of these issues of war, peace, and international order. And then um, I'd like to open it up and get people to say what how they think, or how they imagine, or how they fear or anticipate these kinds of issues playing out, um, and the kinds of challenges we face, and what we might want to be able to try and do. There are seats at the front here. Um, so uh, let me begin by, you know, the, the quote from Trump that begins to explain at least one element of um, how he said that he sees these things, and that is that he says that. America needs to become very strong, very powerful, and very rich once again. And what I want to do is to put that in the context where I think that what we've actually seen in the last 20 years is three different responses to a set of concerns about America in crisis. We can actually spare chairs here if people want to take this. Um, so at 20 years, I, think I can see three basic responses to a shared sense of crisis. Um, about the United States' role in the world. The first one of those was, I think, at least to me, became most clear with um, 20 years ago with the project for a new American century. So this was in the later part of the Clinton administration. And what we saw was a sense of crisis among people who had been longtime players in the American policy making process, try and deal with what they saw as a crisis and a particular response to that crisis. So the founding statement of this project for a new American century, which was signed by uh, Dick Cheney, Donald Rumsfeld, and Paul Wolfowitz, who all became very prominent policy makers in the Bush administration, in their statement issued in 1997, they said, American foreign and defense policy is adrift. Adrift. And that we aim to change this. We aim to make the case and rally support for American global leadership. And they said that what America was now facing a crisis of was of military strength and moral clarity. And that the goal was to have the United States take back upon itself the responsibility to shape a new century favorable to American principles and interests. So I see this basically as a strategy to reconstruct American hegemony given where they saw this process of drift and the lack of commitment to this overwhelming military and ideological presence of the United States in the world that had marked the post-World War II period and through the Cold War. So this I call the Reconstruction School, that to reconstruct American power in the world in the way that it had just been. 
The second response to crisis was Obama. And if you go back to the first inaugural address, you see very clearly the idea of Obama as a reformer. The reform was the answer to crisis. And it wasn't to reconstruct American hegemony, but to reform America's relationship to the world in fundamental ways. And so he also, though, spoke the language of crisis. And he says that we are in the midst of crisis is now well understood. So this is his 2009 inaugural address. Our nation is at war against a far-reaching network of violence and hatred. Our economy is badly weakened, a consequence of greed and irresponsibility on the part of some, but also our collective failure to make hard choices and prepare the nation for a new age. And like the project for a new American century, there was overlap in the sense of a notion of a moral project. Obama talked about how our power alone cannot protect us, nor does it entitle us to do as we please. And he says, our security emanates from the justness of our cause, the force of our example, the tempering qualities of humility and restraint. We will wish for those words in coming years. <laughs> but what you saw there was an attempt to try and reform America's relationship of how it saw itself and how it saw the world by retreating from the American imperial project in the old way and actually have the United States play a more facilitating role in the international system. So the third response to crisis is what I think we're seeing with Trump. And this is what I call the restorationist project. Trump narrates a narrative of crisis, but he sees this crisis as weakness and decline and that the goal, he says, is that to restore American power. So he says, we're a country that doesn't have money. We were a rich country, we're not a rich country. We were a rich country with a very strong military and tremendous capability, we're not anymore. And so, if you read through Trump's many interviews and uh, which can be quite painful, actually. <laughs> Try and read it all in one go. Uh, uh, especially the ones that are literally transcribed with all the ums and ahs and diversions. And, but, so, if he's going to try and restore American power and make America great again, the obvious question is, so when was it great and what does greatness look like that you seek to make it again? And so, buried in there is, he says, I don't think we're viewed the same way that we were 20 or 25 years ago or 30 years ago. And I think that's a problem. So you kind of rewind the clock in your mind and say, okay, 20 years ago, 25 years ago, so we're talking the end of the Cold War. Or 30 years ago. So that's okay. And that's when the project for a new American century said, you know, we're starting to have problems with a great American project. But then Trump gets more specific in a really fascinating way. He says, I would say that during the 1940s and the late 40s and 50s, we were not pushed around. We were respected by everybody. We had just won a war. We were pretty much doing what we had to do, yeah, around that period. <laughs> so this is the America that he seeks to restore. Right? The 1950s, late 1940s, 1950s, America. But if you think about that America and its role in the world, other than from Trump's nostalgia for his childhood, he was born in 1946, um, you actually can come up with a very dark and troubling notion of what restoration of that America's relationship with the world would be. Because this is the time where the United States, at the beginning, had a monopoly on nuclear weapons, where it launched the Cold War, where it built 
hydrogen bombs, even though its scientific advisors told them that thermonuclear weapons were weapons of genocide, and that the United States government should not seek to build them. Their advice was ignored, so the United States launched this project to build hydrogen bombs, and others followed suit. But also, when you see it from the perspective of the rest of the world, it wasn't just the United States launching a project to be able to destroy the planet. But it was the fact that the United States, on a daily basis, was seeking to destroy the process of democracy itself around the world. And I say this because if you look at what US policy was from 1945 through to the, the, through the 1950s, what you see is a massive process of US intervention around the world. Right? So there was not just US intervention in Europe, right? in many ways, politically, to try to subvert political processes and democratic processes in European countries. But also, as the 40s moved into the 50s, the focus of US intervention moved from Europe to the third world. And you saw the overthrow of the elected government of Iran, you saw the intervention in Guatemala, you saw the interventions in Congo, you saw the Korean War, and the list gets longer and longer, and more and more evidence has emerged of the scale and systematic nature of US attempts to reshape the world to make it sympathetic to American business and strategic interests. So this is the Trump vision of what a great America is, where he says, yeah, we could do what we, what we wanted, basically. At the same time, you have to remember that it didn't actually go that well despite these American efforts. So the United States actually was fought to a standstill in Korea. And we still struggle with that legacy today because of the division between North Korea and South Korea and the prospect of, of, of war on the Korean Peninsula. And this was in part because even though the United States was the dominant military player in the, what they called the police action in, um, in Korea, it did take massive military intervention by China with support from the Soviet Union and the loss of millions of Koreans right, over a three year period. And the United States was unable to prevail. And during that time, the use of nuclear weapons by the United States was threatened multiple times, including by one of Trump's heroes, General MacArthur, right? In the Korean War, asked President Truman for permission to use nuclear weapons against Chinese forces on more than one occasion. And Trump talks admiringly of that historical moment. In his interviews, Trump holds up General MacArthur and the threat of use of nuclear weapons in Korea as a winning strategy. Right? That he sees the threat of use of nuclear weapons as a bargaining chip that you can use to force the process to come out in the way that you want, even though it didn't actually work um, in Korea. The, the other thing, of course, is that by the end of the 1950s, and the beginning of the 1960s, the Soviet Union had actually emerged as a strategic competitor, if not a peer, to the United States. And so we had the Cuban Missile Crisis, right? where we looked at the end of the world and everybody had the good sense to step back. But it meant that the United States had to negotiate a compromise in its own backyard. It was deterred. And Trump's idea of a great America is before the United States could be deterred. In other words, where it had the capacity potentially to overwhelm anyone. So this idea that greatness is to be measured by the ability to do what you want and not have restraint by others is, I think, a critical element of how he sees things. So <clears throat> the sense of winning is central to Trump. You know, along with respect, it's kind of the, the trope that emerges almost more often than anything else. And so let me just kind of wrap up my quick comments by a couple of interviews and then uh, a couple of statements by Trump that I want to just read out to you to set the tone and then uh, have a discussion. So for Trump, I think winning matters more than anything. Sometimes it looks like it doesn't even matter what it's about as long as he wins. He says, and I quote, we don't win anymore. When was the last time we won? I mean, he doesn't say won what, but when was the last time we won? Did we win a war? 
do we win anything? We're going to win. We're going to win big folks. We're going to start winning again. And then when it comes to war, he says in particular, when I was young in high school and college, everybody used to say, we haven't lost a war. We never lost a war. And you may remember, America never lost. <coughs> and now we never win a war. We never win. And we don't fight to win. We've either got to win or don't fight. The other thing that goes, as I said, with winning is respect. And so I'm going to end with this quote about respect, which I think is, you know, is stunning when I read it the first time. And these are Donald Trump's words, so I quote, We have been disrespected, mocked, and ripped off for many, many years by people that were smarter, shrewder, and tougher. We were the big bully. We were the big bully, but we were not smartly led. We were the big bully, the big stupid bully. And we were systematically ripped off by everyone from China to Japan to South Korea to the Middle East. We will not be ripped off anymore. So if this is his self-image of American greatness, this big stupid bully, but now with Donald Trump's brain, <laughs> So that we will not be disrespected and not be ripped off by all these people in Japan and China, etc. Because that's the only thing that changes in the story. The difference between the big stupid bully that got its way and Trump's restored America is Trump. Right? So the budget that is being introduced, this massive military expansion and so on that, that he has in mind. And a lot of these other things in terms of thinking about the role of force in the international system is, I think, quintessentially about the exercise of brute force. And that through the exercise of brute force, Trump believes comes respect if it is done shrewdly and with a sense of toughness, and that this is what Trump thinks he's going to be able to provide. So, which for me is a very scary prospect. So what do you think? Sit. Yep. I've I wondered for a long time what the alternative is to waging all these wars that were meant to create new democracies. Is the alternative for us to, to forget about them, them, all those other wars, and just focus on improving our own society and, and not being the hypocrites so that, the, that people like ISIS can't say you're hypocrites and therefore we should attack you? The question of, well, let, let me take a couple of questions together and then we'll have a discussion about, oh, so anyone else? Yeah? It's not a matter of what uh, Trump believes. It doesn't matter. He always was that way. But what, what's terrible is that he won the election that people believed it. That's the terrible part. But that's just the electoral vote, not the popular. I mean, I think that's really important. Yep. Um, I just want to ask, so, I think it's I think it's a good question to see you know what is Trump thinking when he says he want to make America great again. I think that's a, like very admirable to approach it that way. I don't really see the point in ridiculing specific things that you said are turning it into this matter. But what I want to ask is in terms of when you're saying, you know, he said we want to win again when we're be winning. Um, you need to look at it, I think, more specifically. Like, I'm just wondering. So on the one hand, if you look at America, like. I mean, in the end of the 1940s, we, like, a third of products in the world were American. So in that sense, America was winning. Now, I agree with you that we don't want to be doing that if that's at a much greater cost, which I think it is. But I was wondering if you could talk more about what that cost is. Like, is this more of a moral issue or, like, um, in terms of foreign policy? Like, is this, is America not winning or are we making other countries not win? So, um... <clears throat> 
let me try and take a, a couple of those together. So your question is connected to, to the question right there about um, is America winning? The question about you know ISIS and the, the idea that the United States has a responsibility and the means and the obligation somehow to um, promote democracy around the world or to support the promotion of democracy around the world um, is a project that goes back a very long time. And, and it's one of these things that is shared across many elements of the foreign policy and uh, political community in this country. Um, this idea that the United States has an exceptional mission right, to bring goodness to others in the world. I mean, for people like me, this is familiar. We've heard this story for hundreds of years. The Americans are only the latest to carry this claim. Right? And so, you know, the, the British had it, the French had it, lots of people. The Romans had it for crying out loud. Right? And so the, the idea of the justification for imperialism right, is as old as empire. Right? Nobody ever does it by brute force just for the sake of it. They, they always have a reason that makes themselves look good and others look backward. So one has to ask the question, I think, not so much about what the American obligation is in, in all this, but in what ways has the American project to promote its power and role in the world actually subverted exactly the kinds of things that it has claimed that it is doing. And I would argue, you know, following the example of you know many people who've studied and written about this for many, many years, that the US pursuit of its imperial role, even when it's disguised as or done in the name of democracy, has actually most of the time actually involved deliberately subverting the authentic efforts by people in around the world to actually have their own democratic project. Can you use an example? Well, let's start with Iran and the overthrow of the elected government of Iran, or the overthrow of the government in Guatemala, or the, the killing of Lumumba, These are, or Korea, or Vietnam. I mean, if there was ever an example, right? So in all of these cases, the United States decided, we know best. And Kissinger was famous for the kind of callousness with which he talked about it, but it, it was a refreshing and honest callousness, right? That democracy is too good for Chile if they don't do what we want, right? So we'll just overthrow the government of Salvador Allende, right? Democracy is fine as long as it's ours, right? In the same way, terrorists are fine as long as they're ours. Right? It only get bad if they start attacking us. We're happy to support, you know, con contras in Nicaragua who blow up people, but you know, as long as they don't blow us up and do what we want, it's fine. So there's a long and complicated history about this that I think we can put to one side about how and why, uh, how to think about this. But this question about you know ridiculing Trump and you know, what does it mean for America and the cost. There is an element in which I think we have to be honest about Trump's notion of winning. He does see it in almost the terms of what you would call primitive accumulation. Right? He sees that the goal of the United States is that you pay us to protect you or else. Right? So he talks about the Saudis, for example. He says, and I quote, we don't have money anymore because we're taking care of so many people. We're not being reimbursed for the tremendous service that we're performing by protecting various countries. Saudi Arabia is one of them. I think Saudi Arabia without the cloak of American protection, I don't think it would be around. It wouldn't be around for very long. And they're a money machine. In other words, you know, you should pay us to protect you, otherwise we will let you fall. But why are we protecting them? That doesn't figure. Right? He's only interested in the fact that they're rich and they should pay us. And when he talks about NATO, when he talks about Japan, when he talks about South Korea, is that he says, the, our military is not for us. Our military has become an instrument for protecting all of these countries and they're taking advantage of us. Right? It doesn't mean that he says, oh, well, we shouldn't protect them, we should shrink our military because we don't want to have this role. No, he says, we'll, play, we'll keep playing this role, but you have to pay more for it. 
So this is what I meant about this big, stupid bully metaphor that Trump himself uses to describe the United States. That he doesn't talk about demilitarizing the US role in the world. He says, look, you know, we protected all these people. They didn't pay us, so we're going to stop protecting you. We don't need such a big army. And we'll use those resources by cutting military spending to build infrastructure or provide health care or anything. No. He actually says we should build up our military, and you guys should pay more to protect us. So the, the cost is one that the rest of the world should bear for the restoration of American power. Yeah, Ben? Uh, thanks for your talk. Um, I, just in, in hearing you list off all these interventions, um, especially those in the 1950s, I, I was just struck by how um, sad it is that for many Americans, they have no idea that even these things even occurred. Or maybe for some folks, might be, even be able to locate some of these countries on a world map. And that um, for many, many folks it seems that like Trump's Trump Trump seems to be coming from this perspective of uh, not really seeing that I mean he, he certainly doesn't see the human uh, the human side of these things and unfortunately I don't think that many of his supporters do either um, and I guess I don't know if you'd have a comment on ways to um, educate or change um, to see, to, 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 to kind of look at American history with a more critical eye and see how um, lives, in other people, lives of people in other countries have been affected by American policy. Um, yeah. I, I think this is a, a continuing challenge that the United States faces, but it's been a continuing challenge in all countries with empires. I mean, the people who are the citizens and the privileged in the imperial heartlands, be it France or England or now, you know, the United States, they have always had, you know, a view of themselves and of everybody else, right? And everybody else's history matters less. And they only figure in our history to the extent that we save them or they caused us a problem, right? As opposed to having a history of their own. And so, I mean, no one has written about this more clearly, perhaps, than Noam Chomsky and Edward Said, right? about how to reframe and re-understand this question of how the, the actual existence and process of the great imperial project actually starts to come back into the imperial heartland, in its culture, in its education, in its blind spots. And so, you know, if you were going to say, you know, how can we begin to deal with this? One of the most encouraging things that I can actually point to is that over the years, right, more and more scholarship in universities has actually started to embrace the kinds of sensibilities that were once upon a time at the very edges of scholarly thinking about how power and empire actually works in the world and have become mainstream in ways where now Many students have the opportunity to engage with these kinds of ideas. And out of that comes the next generation of people who will go off and teach history in schools. And you know the kind of people who will write stuff in books, make films, make television programs, and actually engage with the rest of society. So I do think we are actually at a hopeful moment. And I actually am encouraged by the fact that the protests that we've seen against Trump and the mobilizations that we've seen against Trump, especially among young people, is actually one expression of the fact that the younger post-Cold War generation right, has a different sensibility about the relationship between the United States and the rest of the world because of the way the world has been um, as they've grown up. And so they are less willing to accept this kind of <coughs> um, two-tier world that their parents and grandparents took for granted and actually saw as not just reasonable, but a good thing. Yep. I want to ask about Steve Bannon and mm -hmm. how, um, in your view, he is influencing some of the rhetoric that is coming from Trump, specifically this talk of like the Judeo-Christian West and how 
his the figure of Bannon is perhaps shaping the idea of America as savior, specifically in contrast to an other, which in this case is Islamic, Muslim, vague and scary. How do you think Bannon um, is currently influencing or will influence the turn that America will take in its foreign policy? Uh, so, so Bannon is an interesting figure uh, in many ways, but not an unfamiliar figure. Right? If you go back to the early years of the Cold War, the, the United States had you know swarms of these you know intellectuals who found justifications for anti-communism, and um, not just in the Soviet Union but everywhere, including at home. Right? This was the kind of structure that led to McCarthyism at home and the overthrow of governments abroad. And it was couched in this formulation of this, you know, almost existential civilizational conflict, right? And Bannon is the inheritor of this kind of thing. But, you know, if you think back just a little bit, the idea of the kind of clash that Bannon talks about between the Judeo-Christian West and, and the kind of rest of the world, and especially Islam, this only echoes stuff that Sam Huntington wrote a few years ago in his Clash of Civilizations, and then his appalling book about how the movement of people from Latin America and Central America to the United States was going to destroy America because they were Catholics and brown and didn't speak English, as opposed to all the previous waves of people who came from Europe. Right? And so Huntington's career, you can trace way back to the you know, early years of the Cold War. You know? And so that kind of way of structuring personal identity with a political project and an imperial sensibility is a familiar one. So I don't think that Bannon stands out as you know a kind of unforeseen, unexpected Rasputin-like figure that you know is, is is there the kind of dark malevolent force in the White House. There's been plenty of people like that who've been warmly embraced and welcomed in Washington D.C. and White Houses for a very long time in this kind of situation. But all I can do is to kind of go back to something that I mentioned uh, earlier this morning, which is that if you want to begin to start thinking about the role of people like Bannon and what we're going to do about people like Bannon, is to go back and read Noam Chomsky's 1967 essay on the responsibility of intellectuals right? and the power of ideas and of communication. Right? This was in the New York Review of Books, February 23rd, 1967. It's online in a million forms. Um, and, but it's absolutely compelling. It was written almost you know, exactly 40 years ago. But you can see the power of ideas and the role that they play and the contest of ideas and ideas about power and responsibility and history. And so this comes back to Ben's question about history. Because what Norm talks about in that essay is the fundamental importance of a deeply informed historical sensibility to understand the current situation as it is unfolding. And so, and this is how we're going to have to deal with Bannon, right? That you can't deal with him at the kind of abstractions that he likes to throw around, because his categories are so self-contained, right? And you actually have to reframe and reformulate and ground this conversation. And so I think that that would be the way to begin to start to think about Bannon, both as a familiar figure and as someone who we know how to deal with in terms of at least the battle of ideas. Yeah? Yeah, when you mentioned McCarthyism, and I was thinking about um, Trump uh, reminiscing and wanting us to go back to that time. And what happened, I'm just curious, how did McCarthyism end? Because I know what it is, and I just don't know how it was over. Yeah, so um, when uh, McCarthy began the anti-communist witch hunts with the House and American Activities Committee, as that process spread to larger and larger sections of the American elite, so he said, oh, there's all these communists in the State Department and, and here, when he started going after the military in particular, right, and other people in uh, key structures of the American policy-making process. That was when the larger self-interest of that policy-making process started to turn against him. And so the, even though you know, the FBI and, and Hoover were sympathetic to parts of this project, um, he trod on too many powerful toes. And so eventually the Congress itself turned against him. So this was it. it you know, he, he was unable to build a political coalition 
that could actually take control over the larger set of policy making processes. And so once you went after people who were actually really powerful, they decided to put an end to this because it was destructive of institutions. Right? One thing is to go purge Hollywood screenwriters, right? And you know, a few people at low levels in the State Department, but once he started to talk about communists in the military and communists in, in, in other areas of people with real power in Washington, DC, they decided to put a stop to it. So um, and so one of the hopes is that you know the, the kind of self-interest of you know the Washington elite, you know, will at some stage begin to try and deal with this problem that you know the, the, the Trump folks are, are creating. But you have to remember that um, the political context of McCarthyism was different, right? in the sense that there was a Cold War. Right? You could actually point to objective processes out there, right? with, with the rise of the Soviet Union and, and so on and so forth. And the fact that inside the United States there was a communist party. Right? There were people on the left, and so you know, he could legitimately point to the fact that, oh yeah, there are communists here. So, and then by guilt by association takes place after that. Right? So we don't have that kind of situation now where you know, the, the purging that will take place will be on different terms. And it will be not of the people in the State Department and so on, perhaps, but it will be the mass deportations of you know, undocumented immigrants, you know, the persecution of politically active uh, grassroots organizers and, and those kinds of people, people who are seen as a threat to political power rather than you know, a battle of ideas, particularly. So this question like that. Hi, um, I am sort of very interested in thinking about the outcomes that we're actually going to see, and I think you did a great job at sort of giving us a precy of his thinking on that. And the actual policy outcomes will be the result of his thinking engaging with the bureaucracy and sort of the machine in the White House and government. And uh, to in how these two collide, I think we've seen three sort of developments that it's in, that would be interesting to take into account. One is the over-reliance and infatuation with military personnel at the expense of civilian bureaucrats, experts. Uh, the second is the gutting and relegation of the State Department to the background of policy making. And the third would be the utter dysfunction or non-existence of an interagency process that actually delivers options to the president on what he can do. And this sort of uh, gives a view onto a scary scenario where essentially the policy process is dysfunctional and then you have a president running roughshod and with a finger on the button. And that, I think, leads me to a kind of scary place. So instead, I wanted to ask you two questions. Uh, one is, do you think Donald Trump will be a sui generis president? Will he have an exceptional foreign policy? Or is there you know, this narrative of regression to the mean to an average hawkish Republican foreign policy? And uh, the second one, I just forgot. So. <laughs> no, that, that, that's a great question. Yeah, so right now, we don't really know how the, the bureaucratic politics of all this will play out. You know, the, the crisis over you know, the replacement of Michael Flynn as national security advisor, you know, being replaced by Mike Master and so on. Um, and to what extent there will be some learning and how these balances of you know, bureaucracy and interest will shift is all still very much in play. But uh, there's a third element missing from, I think, your story. It's not just president plus you know, DC machinery, we are here, right? And that matters a lot. Congress is here, that matters a lot. And the rest of the world is here, and that matters a lot. And right now, I think that the, the big possible players that will actually shape this process and what will create crisis for no matter what combination of Trump and, you know, bureaucracy is in play, will actually be the level of dissent in the American public, because that will actually embolden or demoralize internal critics, right? And it will either enable the formation of countervailing pressures inside the political system, whether it's Democrats, whether it's some in the Republican Party, and moderate Republicans and others, and in the career civil and foreign service and within the military who are willing to take a stand on these kinds of things. Um, if there is not massive and sustained public dissent, there will be less capacity for those kinds of processes to play a role. And similarly with the outside world, the outside world can play a role in either enabling you know, the kind of Trump agenda to play out by feeding into this narrative of crisis, conflict, and military power, or 
he can try and do a process of actually trying to make up for the American withdrawal from key parts of the international system by saying, no, no, we are going to try and sustain the system, at least the bits of it that we think are worth, worth keeping. And so the fact that we would, it would be better for the Russians and the Chinese, and especially the Chinese, not to fall into the dynamic of arms racing against the United States. You know, so some people have already you know, interpreted the relatively modest Chinese increase in their military budget as evidence that the Chinese are trying to send a sign that we're not going to get into an arms race with you. Race against yourself if you want, but we're not doing this. So, whereas if there had been a big bump in Chinese military spending, Trump and others would have said, oh, you see, look, you know, we have to spend even more. You know, I don't want a 350-ship navy, I want a 400-ship navy. So, those kinds of things that the international community can do, whether it be the Paris Agreement or nuclear weapons, etc., these can be things that actually make it much more difficult for a Trump agenda to actually have any traction within the process. And so I think that uh, you shouldn't be afraid of going to the dark place. Mm -hmm. right? You actually have to look into the pit. Mm -hmm. right? um, and the, the, it's a very scary place. But I don't think that you're actually going to see normalization in the way that you describe. Um, in the same way that I think that some people would like to think that Obama was normalized. But I don't think he actually was. Um, I mean, you know, the president that came in in 2009 offering hope and change, and you know, to, to be fair, I went to the first inauguration. You know, I was inspired. I mean, I never thought I would actually see an African-American elected president of the United States in my lifetime. Um, and especially one as politically progressive as he was when he came into office. But in many, many ways, you know, I was disappointed as many other people were disappointed, but he was not normalized. Right? His critique of the policy making process and his attempts to find ways to constrain it and discipline it and restrain it were actually very, very important. And you know, he was very self aware of, of, of that process. Um, so I don't think, you know, with Trump, I think we are going to see not just a sweet, generous president, but a different relationship between president and the policy making process. Because unlike any president I can remember, Trump's claim to authority is almost purely charismatic. Right? It's, it's him. And that, I think, is actually a really interesting, but very different. Uh, and I don't see how he can give that up and still be, you know, uh, Trump. Uh, so I think we have time for one more question. We're actually, We're actually out. out of time. There's another thing in here. So. Okay. We're going to continue the discussion. There are rooms upstairs in um, the first level, um, but yeah, there's another conversation. <laughs>